I'm proud to have on this show now for about the past eight months. I first saw his face in New York City on a television screen very, very late one night in the middle of this program on a local spot on WNBC-TV. His name is Freddie Laker. And he stood before this monstrous DC-10 and he said, not many people put their name on the airplane. This man owns Freddie Laker Airways or Laker Airways. And he is now selling tickets between New York and London at a, at a fraction of their original cost as compared to, say, five years ago. It's called a SkyTrain, and he is about to inaugurate that service between Los Angeles and London. And I don't know the exact fare. What is it, round trip from here to London on, on, when, when Laker gets steamed up? About 320 bucks. And if you fly first class on, uh, on one of the international carriers between Los Angeles and London, the fare can, can run to $1,100, $1,200. So he knocks off a big chunk of change in return for which the passenger gives up some things that most airline passengers don't care about anyway like uh, free coffee and free booze and fancy meals and uh, Caesar salad mixed at the table. Uh, a lot of people choose to give that up and take the savings in their pocket so they can spend the money when they're on their vacations or whatever. So Laker is here tonight to talk about this service and the difficulties he has had inaugurating not only the Los Angeles London service, which begins in September of this year, but the service between New York and London, which began just about uh, oh, eight, nine months ago. Now, we had him booked in New York City for last October, and we were in the middle of a program when we found out that his plane was late. Not Laker Airways planes, but an American carrier that was flying him, I believe, from Toronto down to New York City. And we could not get studio space, nor was Mr. Laker going to be available in New York for the rest of our trip. But he is here in Los Angeles now, setting up his operations for the SkyTrain between here and there. And we'll chat with him about how airline service has changed drastically ever since he started the, uh, the uh, service between New York and London. Now, if you notice, you can get no frills fares and chicken feed fares. And uh, uh, th there must be 14 different fares available on every flight between point A and B in this country and around the world. And I think in large measure, we can thank Freddie Laker. Uh, on the one hand, for making it possible for us to buy airline fares at less money. On the other hand, so confusing the fare picture that few of us can understand it anymore. But he'll be out here to differentiate between the two. Now here is Sir Freddie Laker, Sir Freddie because he was knighted earlier this month, who announced today that he would begin a Los Angeles to London SkyTrain service this fall. He's with us tonight to tell us how he feels about the success of his air service, his airline, and how a young cockney boy grows up to become rich, famous, and knighted by the Queen. But that's for later. Today, Pan American applied, I think, for service between Boston and Amsterdam uh, at a fare of $99 one way, $149 round trip. Now, two years ago, Sir Freddie, that would have been unthinkable. Do you, th do you have the feeling that they're all trying to get on your bandwagon right now? Well, I think that they've all learned a trick or two in terms of marketing. I haven't seen this particular fare of uh, Pan American, but it's obviously uh, below cost, that's for sure. And uh, when this type of fare is put forward by a high cost operator such as Pan American, we then should be looking to the front of the airplane to see how much they're adding to the first class fare and the economy fare to pay for it because this fare is patently below cost. But having said that, I'm all in favor of the consumer. I believe in free and unfettered competition. And uh, I think it demonstrates that Pan American that have had a reputation in the past of being a bit sort of almighty and fuddy-duddy, it, demonstrate that, that it demonstrates that they're getting into the real arena of competitive airfare. How did Freddie Laker, who most of us never heard of, who owned some airplanes over in Great Britain and operated an airline company that, as I say, most people were not aware of at all, get the idea that there was a market for low-cost service between New York and London? And, uh, and an idea, I might say, that drove the major carriers up the wall when you were seeking certification and applying for landing rights in this country and in Great Britain. Well, I applied for the SkyTrain service originally eight years ago on the 15th of June. So it's taken all that time to get there. But, of course, the fact that you haven't heard of me is basically because I've only been in the air business for... 32 years owning and operating airplanes and of course on the other side of the Atlantic on the other side of the Atlantic and not offering consumer flights and uh, in well, this country uh, well I was going to say I think I've been offering consumer flights but they haven't generally been recognized uh, I've been called everything from a maverick Johnny come lately all that sort of thing 
but uh, I have been carrying something like 150 to 200,000 people across the Atlantic for, for some years, and we do manage to carry about half a million people a year on package holidays in Europe and have done for many, many years. So it isn't so much that I haven't been known, it's the fact that I've been fighting and battling with the bureaucrats and the governments and the regulators, and of course that wretched price-fixing cartel called IATA. And uh, we really haven't been able to break out from the almost uh, a prison called IATA. That's to IATA, International yes, Air Travel. International Air Transport Association. Association. It's the trade union of airlines that have been fixing the price ever since World War II. Now, wasn't there an airline, or is there not an airline called Icelandic that for years refused to join IATA? Yes. And did fly some transatlantic uh, flights? And they do now, and they fly to Luxembourg. But once again, th this demonstrates the, the straitjacket that some of us have been in for many years. Even today, 1978, Luftlied, or Icelandic as you call it, are still only permitted to operate their low fare flights from the United States to Luxembourg. They're not allowed to operate the low fare flights into England, for example, or France or Germany. How can you make a profit offering basically a coach seat between New York and London for about $260 round trip, give or take a few bob? Well, I think that I have... When the other airlines have been telling us for years, or IATA, or IATA has been telling us for years, hey, we guarantee your safety, we have all these rules and regulations, but we've also determined the fare has got to be 750 or whatever it is. How can you make a profit at that thing? Well, first of all, I want to uh, get you away from the misdirection about the coach seat. The airplanes that I use, the, the wide-body DC-10, is the same airplane that everyone else uses. There's nothing different about the airplane. The, the answer to the question is specialization. I specialize in low fare air transport. The airplanes are usually adapted for this business. For example, I don't own, let alone carry a first class seat. I don't carry cargo. In consequence, I have one class airplanes. We like to think they're all first class, of course. Uh, we put the kitchens downstairs. We've taken the smell out of the sitting room, so to speak. That gives us more room in the airplane to put the seats. And in consequence, we operate the DC-10, the 345 economy class seats. They're all reclining. They have a minimum of 34 to 35 inches of pitch between them. And we have the same service on board as any other air carrier. But the difference is that we offer the air transport at the minimum cost and we sell everything else that goes with it. In other words, we don't charge a fare that permits us to pour whiskey into the fellow's ear, you know, as if it's mm -hmm. sort of just been invented. If the fellow wants a glass of whiskey on our airplane, he pays for it. If he wants to eat, he pays for it. Or he can bring his own food. We don't mind. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got movers on the airplanes, but of course you pay extra for it. Uh, on the other hand, of course, it's a very tightly knit company. It's an individually owned company. It's real private enterprise. There aren't a lot of stock, uh, aren't, a lot of, aren't a lot of issues of stock on the market that one would want to go out and buy Laker Airways right now. There are, there's no, no stock, stock on the market. Sale, right? None. Absolutely none. Now, yes. if I wanted to have a dinner and watch a picture and have a couple of boozes and a cup of coffee, roughly what would it cost me above the fare? to have that? Well, the meal would cost you $3, mm -hmm. the movie will cost you $2, and we charge a dollar for the drink, and it's duty-free, but it's a, a fair size one. You don't need too many to get sloshed. So, no, I don't want to get sloshed. No, but you could get happy, let's put it that way. For about $8 altogether, you could get reasonably happy, and uh, that would give you the movie and the food. But how are you able to do that where the others have said so long they could not? Well, in, in terms of food, of course, we don't throw any away. You see, we don't waste food. We don't put food on the airplane for everyone to eat and half of them leave it. And we reckon that that alone, in terms of wasted food, 
saves us $1,400 a day.